part two of my top 15 most favorite anime of all time. And this time I'm going to be discussing my numbers 10, 9, 8, 7, and 6 entries. So let's get started. Now number 10 is actually a tie between Honey and Clover and No Dame Cantabile. Now these two I put in the same entry because... When you think about it, these two anime basically talk about college life and the struggles that these college students face every day, though combining slice of life, drama, and a lot, repeat, a lot of well-executed, well-written, and just fun comedy. So let's start out with Honey and Clover. Now, Honey and Clover tells the story of five art college students by the names of Yuta, Takumi, Shinobu, Hagumi, and Ayumi. Now, they basically go through a lot of trials as college students, whether that comes to, like, how they see their futures, how they deal with relationships, and how they deal with their passions, and how they deal with each other. And they get themselves into a lot of colorful situations, and also a lot of heartfelt situations as well. And this, I have to say, has a lot of great character dynamics, especially between all of the five characters, and especially when it comes to Shinobu and Hagumi. Now, when it comes to the animation, it's very, like, very muted, almost like, um, like you see a painting before your very eyes. And it has a very muted palette all throughout. And it manages to make its characters almost like real people. And that's what I really find refreshing about shows like Honey and Clover and No Dame Cantabile. And like I said, this has a very, like, very gentle art style. Though at times it can be quite cartoony, but it manages to do it for comedy's sake. And the characters are all charming and all lovable, especially Shinobu Morita, who is voiced by Yujo Ueda and Sam Regal. And I have to say that, like, Shinobu, every time he makes Hagumi put on that leaf and as an umbrella, and he at first has this very stern face, and he proceeds to, like, take pictures of her all around. That is definitely a huge show stealer for me. He's definitely one of the funniest characters I have ever seen in a uh, Jose anime and manga, and he definitely steals the show for me. Another character that manages to steal the show for me definitely has to be Hagumi, because, well... At first glance, you might think, well, she's 18 years old and is a first year high, excuse me, college student, but she looks a lot younger, like, let's say about, I don't know, 10 years old, and, well, she's also very cute and very lovable as well. In fact, the huge majority of the cast of Honey and Clover is extremely lovable, and they all have a sense of goofiness. And at the same time, they're very down-to-earth. And it's just a lot of fun seeing these characters grace the screen. And then when we, we're talking about No Dame Cantabile, it's also quite similar to Honey and Clover, though this takes place in a music college. And this talks about what the usual struggles of, the, of music students go through. And the bread and butter of this series is mainly the relationship between Megumi Noda, a.k.a. Nodame, and Chiaki. Now, Megumi Noda is basically a character who's, like, very ditzy, very unorganized, yet very sweet, and somewhat naive. Whereas Chiaki, he's very stern, very strict, uptight, yet very direct. And when it comes to their relationship together, it's a sort of cat and mouse thing, though has actually grown into something a lot more intimate and something that is actually a lot more meaningful to both of them. And I definitely enjoy their chemistry, and especially with the other side characters, like that German music professor. I thought he managed to steal the show for me too. And especially his agent, her, which her name is Elise. 
Yeah, Elise also manages to steal the show from me because she is just so over the top in how she wants to, like, make things go her way, even if she has to use, like, kidnapping and even bribing and all those type of other things that you would pray to God that she won't do. Oh, and did I also mention that Elise was also voiced by Tomoko Kawakami. Yeah, it just really shows you how versatile she really is. However, when Tomoko Kawakami was in her sick leave, she was, like, temporarily replaced by Kumi Sakuma. Though, in the English dub, she was voiced by Karen Strassman. Hmm, something very interesting. Kawakami and Strassman have both voiced Soifan from Bleach. And hearing Kawakami as Elise was just rollickingly hilarious. I'm also quite surprised that she managed to use such a very deep and very womanly voice for a character like Elise. I almost thought that was Michiko Neya voicing Elise because, well, when it comes to voicing older female characters, you usually think Michiko Neya. Though with Tomoko Kawakami, it really is a testament just to how versatile she really is as a voice actress and how I'm actually quite sad that she was no longer with us in June 9 of 2011. So, yeah. So, with that out of the way, the other stand-up performances for me are Ayako Kawasumi as Nodame and Tomokazu Seki as Chiaki, both of them being very veteran voice actors and really working well off of each other. And that's why Hanyin Clover and Odame Cantabile stand very firm on my number 10 spot. Number 9 has to go to Kino's Journey. Now, Kino's Journey tells the story about a young girl who dresses up as a boy by the name of Kino, and she goes to many different lands accompanied by her talking motorcycle by the name of Hermes. Now, during her travels, she meets a lot of very interesting and very different people, though at times also, like, seems to get some remnants of her past life. Now, what really makes this anime very interesting for me is just how she relates to all these people, and we get to see certain flashbacks of... Kino and how she was as a child. Not to mention, did I mention that Kino is also very much a badass, especially with that gun? Yeah, she is just awesome with how she manages to handle her weapon. She's definitely one of my most favorite anime marksmen, or excuse me, markswomen of all time. She's just a lot of fun to watch, and also one that I really enjoy watching, and one that I also kind of empathize with. And this is also helped by the voice acting done by Kelly Cousins and Amaeda. And also helped by, even though the very simplistic animation, though it manages to be, be very, like, gorgeous and simply put, very... It, mean, it manages to really leave you glued to the screen with just how its animation flows very well. It flows very fluently, and it's just so gorgeous. And not to mention the topics that the characters talk about is something that you like to think about almost every day. So this is why I really enjoy watching this anime. It's very heartfelt, it's very intelligently written, has a lot of lovable characters, especially Kino and Hermes, and not to mention, the voice work done by Kelly Cousins as Kino is absolutely top-notch. And this is by far probably one of my most favorite roles from her of all time. Number eight has to go to GTO, aka Great Teacher Onizuka. Now this is a very hilarious, fun and simply put, balls to the wall. Like, simply put, a lot of... It's just a lot of fun. It's just really balls to the wall. Especially when it comes to the humor. And even the characters in this anime 
are just simply put so much fun to watch, especially Onizuka. Now, Great Teacher Onizuka tells a story about a punk by the name of, or excuse me, a former motorcycle gang member by the name of Eikichi Onizuka. And he dreams of becoming a teacher because he thinks that like being a job, having a teaching job means that he gets to teach young girls and might have like a certain amount of affairs with them. Though he discovers that when he gets his job as a teacher, he finds out that a lot of the kids are either bullies, manipulators, or just simply put thugs and have been harassing every single teacher into madness. Yeah, and once he comes in, he manages to somewhat be a very good friend to them and manages to really teach them that, you know, when it comes to life, when it comes to the guys, they have to be real men. And when it comes to the girls, they just have to be like very honest with themselves and remember to never like be bitchy or manipulative to others because once they do that, they'll encounter very unsavory people later on. And that's what I really like about Onizuka as a character. I mean, on the outside, he may seem like a very pervy type of character who may seem kind of stupid, impulsive, violent, and somewhat goofy. I mean, extremely goofy. But once you get to know him a lot better, he's absolutely no nonsense. He really cares and really believes in what he truly believes in and has a very unorthodox set of morals and codes that he lives by. And especially the ones that he, like, manages to show his students. Though not in a very preachy way, but in a very unconventional and very unorthodox way. Which sort of irks certain teachers like the vice principal, who is also extremely funny as well. And this all help. this basically helps in terms of the voice acting. Now I can also say that the animation is pretty good for its time, though it's quite dated since this came out in 1998, and its age pretty much shows. But still, if you take away that datedness, it's actually held up very well, and especially when it comes to the various expressions that Onizuka makes. Now, yes, he is quite a handsome fellow, but I have something to ask. Why does he... Why does he make all these ugly expressions? Well, I guess it's kind of to deconstruct that sometimes handsome guys can be silly looking too. Maybe. But this is all helped in terms of the great voice acting, especially coming from Wataru Takagi voicing Eikichi Onizuka. This has got to be one of his most well-known roles of all time and every time I listen to the Japanese track I really had a lot of fun with listening to Takagi-san in this role. It's just so much fun. Not to mention there are also a lot of other voice actors and voice actresses that manage to lend their voices to each of the characters like Ishin Chiba, Tomoko Kawakami, Ayako Kawasumi, and Kotono Mitsuishi. Now, Kotono Mitsuishi in this anime voiced Urumi Kanzaki, who is very hilarious, but also quite devious as a character. But what really makes her hilarious is just how devious she can be. And on the English side, you have Stephen J. Blum as Onizuka and Wendy Lee as a lot of the female characters, alongside Felice Sampler, and also the late Bob Pappenbrook, who voiced the vice principal. And did I also mention that Felice Sampler also voiced probably one of my most favorite side characters, and that is Hidemi Ota. Yeah, she managed to make Hidemi Ota a very nasally sounding character. Yeah, believe me, you'll have a lot you'll have a blast when you hear Hidemi Ota talk in English, even though 
and the Japanese side, she was voiced by Tomoe Hanba, and she managed to give Hidemi a very, like, snooty, snooty type of tone. But with, like, Felice Sampler voicing Hidemi Ota, she managed to make Hidemi sound like an evil nerdy girl, and one that I had a lot of fun watching, just because of how she was able to pull it off. So yes, GTO is definitely a very hilarious and very raunchy comedy that I can't stop laughing. And this all has to do with the English dub, provided so amazingly well by Stephen J. Bloom, Wendy Lee, Bob Pappenbrook, and Felice Sampler. It was just a ride that was just so worthwhile. Number seven has to go to... Actually, this is also another Thai um, entry. And that goes to Full Metal Alchemist 2003 and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Yes, these basically belong in the same franchise, which is, of course, Full Metal Alchemist. Now, what really intrigues me about these adaptations of the same franchise is how they managed to tell their stories, but they managed to tell that it's a tale of redemption because the story goes like this. This tells the tale of the Elric brothers, older brother Edward and younger brother Alphonse. Now their mother passed away and they tried to find a way to revive her through alchemy, but this little project of theirs went haywire as Al loses his entire body, and Ed only loses his arm, and, well, they have to search for the Philosopher's Stone in order to atone for their mistakes. And alongside, they meet a lot of very interesting people, though people who are also on the hunt for the Philosopher's Stone, either for good or for evil. And alongside, there are a lot of interesting like questions about life and death and religion that even get talked on about the show, though not in the preachiest way, but it's done very subtly and very masterfully. And that's why I really love about Full Metal Alchemist. Everything about it works, whether I'm watching the 2003 version or the 2009 reboot. Everything about Full Metal Alchemist works in terms of its story. It manages to really combine the elements of drama, horror, sci-fi, mecha, actually not really mecha, but um, comedy, slice of life, fantasy, and adventure, and really make it a melting pot of just how well executed the stories really are and sure the 2003 version it's quite guilty of having a few fillery episodes but in the 2009 version it manages to stay very true to what the manga was telling and yes they do feel like different stories but when it comes to the core of full metal alchemist it's definitely a very thought-provoking exciting and simply put, an epic story about redemption. And especially when it comes to the brotherhood. And excuse, excuse, excuse me, the brotherly bond that Edward and Alphonse have. And how they deeply care for each other. And how they support each other no matter what they do in life. This is definitely a true testament of just how close they really are and how they really work well off each other. And this is also thanks to the fantastic voice acting. Now, in the Japanese dub, the standouts have to be Romi Paku and Rie Kubimiya as the Elric brothers. And considering the other projects that these two have also worked on, these manages manage to be their best roles. In fact, it's absolutely their most memorable roles of all time. Now, Romi Paku is generally very well known for voicing a lot of hot-blooded, very angry young boys and young men, all thanks to her very husky voice. And she can also voice extremely sexy women. And 
with Edward Elric voiced by Romy Paku, this is definitely a standout portrayal. And Rie Kugimiya, though she's extremely well known for voicing a lot of tsundere characters who are mostly in their teens or kids, and even is very well known for voicing young girls, Hearing her as Alphonse is extremely refreshing to me because she manages to pull off playing a, vo a boy very well. And in the English dub, you have Vic Mignogna as Edward Elric. In the 2003 version, you had Aaron Dismuke, who was, well, 12 years old since this was recorded in 2004. And he managed to portray Alphonse very well and really has a certain innocence to him. And then in the 2009 version, you had Maxi Whitehead. She still manages to play Alphonse's innocence and, well, intelligence very well, though I actually have to go with Aaron Dismuke's performance. Maxi Whitehead manages to be very good in her own standards. And I actually watch this a lot in English because well, when you think about it, this is one of the best English dubs that I've ever heard of all time. And this is all thanks to the ensemble cast. Not only do you have voice actors like Vic, Vic Mignogna, you also have others like Caitlin Glass, Christopher Sabat, Travis Willingham, Carrie Savage. Heck, even Scott McNeil in it is in this. Well, mainly in the 2003 version, but he was also voiced by John Swayze in the 2009 ver version in which he voiced Van Hohenheim. So basically, the 2003 Full Metal Alchemist is a huge ensemble cast, gathering the most prolific voice actors from L.A., New York, and not just from Texas, and even from Canada. Now, that's just a huge ensemble piece. And one that is extremely impressive by today's standards. Not to mention Laura Bailey as Lust. Awesome. Just awesome. So yes, Full Metal Alchemist, whether it's the 2003 version or the 2009 version, managed to be very superb in their own merits. Number six has to go to Gurren Lagann. Probably one of the best mecha anime of all time, and probably what is 2007's best anime of all time. Now, Gurren Lagann manages to be very exciting in its own special way by being a coming-of-age story, especially for the character of Simon. This shows Simon's passage to manhood, and done very well, and done very epically. And believe me when I say that Gurren Lagann is one of the most epic anime of all time. In fact, I have mentioned this anime during my review of Mr. Peabody and Sherman and how the final scene of, well, that movie managed to remind me of the final fight scene of Gurren Lagann. You have a whole cast of characters and then there is this huge calamity that they're going to be sucked in. And it almost reminded me of the final boss fight of Gurren Lagann. That's how, like, how, that's how much of a legacy this anime has made. And that's how it managed to inspire a whole generation of anime fans and a lot of cartoon fanatics to really, like, go to this anime. It's that awesome in every single way. Yes, every character in this show, they're just very lovable and a lot of fun, especially Kamina. Kamina is, without a doubt, probably one of the most balls-to-the-wall awesome characters of all time. The manages the way he manages to go head first into battle is just extremely awesome. Everything about Kamina is just just bursting with a certain like infectious nature that he has. And especially when it comes to his over-the-top speech. It's just that over-the-top and hilarious to listen to that it's just wonderful. But the main meat of the story is mainly Simon's journey into becoming a man. 
he starts off as a 14-year-old boy, very unsure and somewhat, like, sheltered and unsure of what he should do in life. But when you see him mature, it's almost epic. It is just simply put an epic story of how one boy has to put aside his childish dreams and childish desires and become a man in the real way possible. This is just simply put a very touching and very inspiring tale of growing up. And this is also helped by the phenomenal voice acting. In the Japanese dub, you have Tetsuya Kakihara, Tatsuki Konishi, Nobuyuki Hiyama, Michiko Neya, Mitsuki Saiga, and a lot of other great Japanese voice actors lending their talents into these characters. The standouts for me in the Japanese dub have to be Tetsuya Kakihara as Simon, Katsuyuki Konishi, excuse me, Katsuyushi Konishi as Kamina, Nobuyuki Hiyama as Viral, and Michiko Neya as Adiana the Elegant. Now, I really love Nobuyuki Hiyama and Michiko Neya as voice actors, and I felt that the chemistry really worked. And besides, I've heard these two as Siegfried and Sofitia, respectively. So the fact that they've managed to play these characters that managed to get into each, to each other's throats, though Adiane manages to get into Viral's throat a lot throughout the course of the anime, is just so fascinating. And it just really shows why Michiko Nea and Nobuyuki Hiyama definitely have awesome chemistry together, when especially voicing these two characters. And on the English dub, you have the likes of Kyle Hebert voicing Kamina. He is just awesome at what he did in this role. He managed to make Kamina a very proud and very put over-the-top character. He's just simply put so much fun to listen to that it's just every bit of awesomeness. And I really respect Kyle Hebert as a voice actor because he really earns that respect all thanks to Kamina. And with that said, Gurren Lagan is number six on my spot for the top 15 best animes of all time, in my opinion. Well, that's part two of this list, so stay tuned for the final part, in which I talk about the final five that managed to make it on my top 15 favorite anime of all time.